bust of Ed Buck might not have happened when it did, might not have happened at all, were it not for our next guest, journalist and advocate Jasmine Kanick. Last month, she received the John Anson Ford Human Relations Award from the L.A. County Board of Supervisors. The board commended Kanick on her willingness to take on uncomfortable and difficult to discuss issues around race, politics, and society. And Jasmine Kanick joins us now. Thank you for being here. And there's a lot of details uh, and questions to ask, but the first one, which I've never really seen talked about, is why and how you first took on this particular cause and case, because it, it seemed to have a pretty strong hold on you for years now. Why not? <laughs> yeah. I'm a black person. Black people are dying. Uh, black people are getting hurt in uh, some, a, a white man's apartment in West Hollywood, why, why wouldn't I care, yeah. you know? Not so much why so, wouldn't you care, but was there something that happened? Did you see something, yeah, someone, hear something? Yeah, someone died. That's what happened, right? I think that's what happened for all of us, right? That sort of um, made us aware of what happened. In terms of my um, involvement, I was asked by a friend, uh, a reporter, um, to connect with Jamal Moore's mother, mm. uh, and I did. And from there, it just ended up being this journey of two plus years of, of fighting together and not really thinking when, when we first spoke that it would end up being another person that was dead, yeah. that I would end up, you know, being contacted by all of these victims of Ed Bucks, that it would just end up being what it, what it morphed into, which was, um, you know, a fearless and very um, long campaign for justice. And, and let's hone in on that word, long. Why do you think it took so long? Well, you know, I think there are a lot of, there were a lot of issues at play. You have um, a person who is beloved by uh, some, mostly the people he gives money to. So he's a, he's a political donor to the Democratic Party. Um, he is someone who's known as an animal rights activist, an LGBT activist, an HIV AIDS activist. I think that as humans inherently, we just don't want to believe that someone could be that sadistic, that mm. cruel, that there could actually be someone living this sort of double life. Although history has shown us, it has happened time and time again. Even with our most notorious serial killers, that they, that the public, their family, their friends had one idea, this one picture of who they were, but they were really also another person. And that's exactly what the case was with Ed Buck. Yeah. Um, um, during the day, he was an upstanding, you know, citizen to the, you know, in terms of to his community. He was someone you could, you know, count on to uh, give money to democratic causes. He was an activist, um, but he was also the man who used online, um, who who went online to seek out um, young black men who. Um, were vulnerable yeah. and he's also the man who provided them with one of the most deadliest drugs that we have in America right now which is crystal meth. And that was happening even after the deaths of Jamel Moore, even after the death of Timothy Dean. Mm -hmm. He and, never stopped. And there was a big turning point it seems that happened here that I'd like to explain for our viewers and this is what happened on September 11th of this year. A man who goes by Joe Doe in court records uh, overdosed at Buck's apartment but he didn't die, unlike these two other men. Can you share with our audience what is known about what exactly happened and how that turned the case in many ways? So just to be clear, uh, people like to say he was the third victim. Joe Doe was not mm -hmm. the third victim. He was just the victim that ended up helping set off the chain of actions that uh, the, the chain reaction that happened just in terms of his arrest. Yeah. It is true Joe Doe did not um, die, which was similar with a lot of the other victims. They didn't die. Um, but what was different about this was that he did um, go to the authorities and the authorities actually listened. We had other victims that did similar situations that went to the West Hollywood Sheriff's Station, but the authorities did not do anything. And this time something actually happened. And so um, Joe Doe's case is the state case, is the case that Lacey's office is, is handling, is, is the case that um, if Ed Buck were prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law, he would get like five years and eight months. Mm -hmm. 
um, it is not the it, while we think it's an important case, it is not the case that we're the most interested in. We're interested in the federal case. Right, eyes on the prize. Yes. There. But can we talk for a moment because you mentioned these other victims, and there has been some discussion of that as well. And I, and I do want to ask you about that because later on in the program, we're going to hear from Jackie Lacey, and she insists that uh, she and her colleagues really tried to follow up on on who those men were and their stories, but they felt like they met roadblocks all along the way, that when they tried to corroborate their records, the evidence wasn't there. And, and that a lot of times they were concerned about coming forward because maybe they had used drugs and they were worried about the repercussions. Can you just talk a little bit about that and, and who these other men are and some of the difficulties at play here in trying to really bolster that case? So Jackie Lacey is in her, her save her butt mode right now. And so a lot of what she says about this case simply is not true. She likes to say that about us and our facts. And I'm going to say that about hers. It's simply not true. There, yes, it is true that some of the men, most of the men, had apprehensions about coming forward. That is why we fought and made sure that Lacey's office gave them limited immunity. Yeah. Because they are, at the end of the day, black men going in to talk about things that they did with Ed Buck that are crimes. And we know that this criminal justice system, whether you are a victim or... Um, or the, the, the defendant, the person who committed the crime, they will arrest you. So we wanted to make sure that they, were, that they were covered, and we did that. We had a due diligence to do that. We were asking these men to come forward with their evidence, including videos and photos and text messages and um, receipts through, like, you know, Cash App and Venmo, the ways mm. that AdBuck would pay them. Yeah. Um, their airline tickets, uh, you know, that show AdBuck paid for, for, you know, flew them into town and flew them back out. So let to be very clear, you know, I, I'm not new to this. Yeah. If people come to me and say that they were a victim of Ed Buck, I don't just say, oh, yeah, you're, you're a victim of Ed Buck. You know, let me, you know, let me hear your story. No, we vet people. We make okay. sure that people are telling the truth. These men were telling the truth. Would you think one of them would come? Because I'm very interested no. in... But so why wouldn't they come here? I guess that's what I'm getting I don't at. think that they would because some of them have moved on with their life. Mm. And they don't want people to know, their co-workers, mm -hmm. um, the students they go to school with, or maybe even their families, yeah. right? Um, some are still engaged in this life. Yeah. Okay? Some are not in a position to come on your show because they are drug users. Yeah. And so... Uh, I know there's always this, you know, we want, we want to talk to the victims. With There's an active case going on right now, just like the sheriff's department would tell you if yeah. they are the district attorney's office. You know, they really don't like when, you know, witnesses and victims talk to the media because it could mess up their... They're trying, we have a big trial coming up. Yeah, no, yeah. that makes sense. Jasmine, we just have a few seconds left here, and this is just yeah. a huge question, but I feel like it's important that we end on a note. You have been working on this, as you mentioned, for years. Ed Buck now is, sits behind bars. Where does this have you feeling right now about justice in Southern California in the year 2019? If you could just sum up in a few words. I'm looking forward to the DA's race. That's where it has me right now. I'm very invested in who our next district attorney is going to be. Um, I obviously, we all feel good. All the people who worked on Justice for Jamel and all of Ed Buck's victims, we feel very, very good that Ed Buck is sitting behind bars right now. But as you know, um, jail is your pit stop on the way to prison, yeah. or it's your get, at, or you go back home. Yeah. And so, what we want to see happen in August when this trial starts is an actual conviction of Ed Buck, a substanti substantial prison time. Yeah. Jasmine, thank you so much for spending your time here. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And coming up on the program, we will delve into the legal intricacies of Ed Buck's case. We'll